today we've decided to fly in to the abandoned nuclear missile site at Green and Common. Join us as we explore and tell some Cold War stories. Greenham Common, one of the most controversial airfields of the Cold War, had been high on our list of places to explore since first learning to fly. A local site to both Paul and I, we were familiar with some of the history and the impressive nuclear storage bunkers that still remained at the site. Initially, we had just planned to fly over the airfield and take some photos, but after spotting a large, clear section of the old runway, we decided to land and explore the airfield on foot. We found a small clearing to hide our gear and then started the walk along the nearly two mile long runway towards the bunkers. How creepy does that look? A Cold War relic still sat here after all those years. And it still looks like how, how I imagine it would look back in the day. Three layers of fencing and it just looks sinister. Look at the doors. And even the crows, they're not really doing much to add a friendly vibe to the place. So obviously Greenham Common was used during the Second World War and then it became a US Air Force base afterwards as Cold War tensions started to escalate in the 50s. And Greenham Common became the home of 96 nuclear missiles, so cruise missiles that were stored within these bunkers themselves. Now it's not to be confused with a missile silo. These bunkers held vehicles that would bomb burst out into the countryside strategically and launch their payload in the event that we needed to uh, counter-attack. And I find that sinister, but they're still here now. The locals weren't happy, but um, I think the main problem was the Women's Peace Corps. So obviously Greenham Common became a target for protesters and the Women's Peace Corps sort of camped outside continually and they'd stage break-ins, get into the airfield itself. But bravely enough, they even managed to get into the airfield and across these three layer of fences into where the missiles were stored. Presumably with armed guards as well. Yeah, but have had armed guards, razor wire, the lot. They broke in and got on top of the bunkers and danced around on the top. I think that's pretty ballsy. I heard they used to stop traffic as well when they were doing these tests, the drills. Yeah, so obviously NATO would conduct exercises where the vehicles would be put on short notice and at some point they'd be crashed out into strategic locations in the countryside. The Women's Peace Corps would chase them down in cars and sort of get in the way, try and block them and just create just make their nuisance. life hard. Huh? Loads of angry women chasing after you. It sounds a bit like your life, mate. Yeah, it sounds like me when I was 18 and every nightclub I ever went into. <laughs> I wish that was true. The camp began in September 1981 after a group called Women for Life on Earth arrived at Greenham to protest the decision to store nuclear missiles there. The first blockade of the base occurred in March 1982, with 250 women protesting, during which 34 arrests and one death occurred. The camps became well known when on April 1983, around 70,000 protesters formed a 14-mile human chain from Greenham Common to the Ordnance Factory at Burfield. The last missiles left the base in 91, but the camp remained in place until 2000. The media attention surrounding the camp inspired people across Europe to create other peace camps. When the Americans left in the early 90s, they had to remove thousands of miles of cables. Now remember, it was an active airfield. And if you look closely on Greenham Common, you can still find a few exposed like this. Due to the sheer scale of the base, we decided to deploy the drone to see what else there was to explore. The plane behind me here was a replica C-130 built in 1986. They used to fill it with seats, pat, like pretend passengers, bits of luggage, 
They'd spray the whole thing in kerosene and then set it alight and practice dealing with an aircraft fire. On the wings, they had mounted a couple of boxes and they used to pump kerosene into those boxes to simulate a jet engine catching fire. The water surrounding it would actually stop the fire spreading to other parts of the common and becoming a real problem. These kerosene fires were actually so hot that they've warped the metal over time. Greenham Common is surrounded by stories and myths that have emerged from Cold War secrecy. We decided to visit the air traffic control tower, a place that was at the centre of what was nearly a catastrophic nuclear event. talk about an alleged incident that happened here in 1958. A B-47 bomber was taken off from the airfield and they developed problems shortly after takeoff. Now the bomber had to jettison its two external fuel tanks, each containing 1,700 gallons of aviation fuel. Now one of the tanks hit a hangar and the other tank hit another B-47 that was on the tarmac. Now I can imagine at the time the air traffic controllers in that tower were very nervous because that B-47 on the tarmac was carrying a nuclear weapon. Now, the fire didn't detonate the nuclear weapon, it doesn't quite work like that, but it's alleged that it did damage the nuclear weapon to an extent where plutonium and uranium was spread as far as eight miles in the local area. Newbury Council conducted a series of surveys in later years and concluded that there was no plutonium and no uranium in the area. However, the Cold War was full of secrets and lies. And let's just say, I wouldn't even grass around here. Oh my god, Ben. Hold that torch. Oh, 